Hi there and thanks for joining me again today. In this video I want to take quite a relaxed look at the topic of neural networks and work through a bit of an online course as a way to introduce people to the subject. Neural networks is not something that I am an expert in, it's something that I'm just learning for my own interest and so for people who are wanting to do the same hopefully you can sit back and watch this video and enjoy just learning a few new things along the way. This study series is part of a partnership I have with Brilliant.org so thanks to them for letting me show you through their course. There will be a link in the description if you would like to sign up for your own account so that you can follow through the course with me. So I'm here on Introduction to Neural Networks and I'm going to go down to the quiz I want to work through today and that is this one here called Neural Networks. So far in the course they've gone through a bit of an introduction into artificial intelligence and the challenge of trying to create a machine that can essentially think or play games uh, in a way that a human player might do as well. And it's not such an easy job because as it says here the human brain automatically performs tasks that don't break easily into algorithmic rules for a computer to follow. So to create an intelligence that resembles that of a human, what we're trying to do in neural networks is kind of model the way that the brain is structured and that is with neurons. So it says here the brain contains more than 80 billion cells called neurons which influence one another via small pulses of electricity. A particular neuron doesn't talk directly with every other neuron, they are connected into structures that perform specialized functions. These structures are biological neural networks. We've got a little picture of a neuron here. So for us, every time we learn a new game, a dance or a mathematical skill, neurons strengthen their lines of communication with some neurons and prune their connections with others. The structure of neural networks evolves as you gain new abilities. Artificial neurons, the basic units of an artificial neural network, behave more or less like biological neurons. An artificial neuron responds to information and signals it receives and sends out its own signal to other neurons. We have one artificial neuron down here with four inputs and each of these inputs can either be on or off. When the neuron is completely coloured in black, like it is now, that means it is fully activated by the inputs. And if it was fully white, that means its activity is inhibited. And if it's some mixture in between, maybe something like this halfway, then it is just partially activated. Some of these inputs are increasing the activation, and well, those are the ones in green, and the one in pink is decreasing its activation. See if I turn them all on and then turn the pink one on, it actually goes down. So inputs can either be positive or negative in that sense. In this next example, we have a snack dispenser with cookies or celery. And if either the cookies or the celery or both are turned on in the input, the neuron will be fully activated. This little white triangle here is the bias of the neuron, so we could increase that. And now when we turn on either of these inputs, they don't quite reach the bias, so the neuron isn't activated. The bias needs to be in the middle here to be activated by either of these. The point is that with these little artificial neurons, they follow rules mechanically um, as we go from inputs to outputs, and our artificial neurons can have a different response to the same inputs if we make slight changes to its internal configuration. The real power of the neurons comes from wiring them together into a network. Our neural network is kind of a waterfall of individual neurons. We feed the output of one neuron into the input of another and it cascades like that along the network. It says here that by stacking neurons in layers, we create the potential to make increasingly complex predictions, as long as we can find the right connections between the layers. 
And that's what it seems to come down to is forming these correct connections with the correct weights to know what inputs we want to cascade throughout the network. In this little example here, we have an artificial network that can recognize the numbers zero through nine. So we can draw something down here and hopefully this neuron up here corresponding to two will be quite filled, quite activated, and that will indicate that it knows that it's a two. You can see that it's never completely binary. So there's, as we go on, elements of activation in many of these neurons in the top layer, but it seems to be doing a pretty good job at recognizing which number I'm drawing. Maybe my four doesn't look quite like theirs. Maybe I need an open top four here. There we go, that worked better. So as I'm drawing on the input grid, the input moves into two layers of 25 neurons, which then result in our guess in the top layer up there. We'll come back to this particular network and actually have a look at the real code that is behind it a little bit later in the video, but we'll continue going with the course for now. Just keep in mind that we'll come back to this. We've jumped into a quiz called Decision Boundaries and here they are modeling a binary neuron which just means that it can either be completely activated or not activated, on or off, there is no in between. And they're building this model of the binary neuron just by thinking about a little laser and an LED. So the LED will turn on when the input intensity from the laser is enough to reach the bias setting on the LED. So anything above this setting, the LED will turn on, anything below, and it's off. We could move that bias to be a little bit lower, and yeah, we'd be able to turn it on with less intensity of light. That enables us to answer how our intensity and the bias related when the LED is activated. Well, it's when the intensity is greater than or equal to the bias level. We could also have an LED with two lasers. Remember that this is the input to our neuron. And if it's in a neural network, it might be the output from the previous row of neurons. In this case, to activate the LED, we would need some intensity from either one or both lasers. All that matters is that the intensity from laser one plus the intensity from laser two is bigger than or equal to the bias level. In this example in the quiz, we're imagining that we're playing a game against a robot opponent. And at some point, the robot decides that it's had enough and doesn't want to play anymore. And we're going to plot some data to try and see if we can predict when the robot will want to keep playing and when it will want to quit. So on this plot here, we have some data points where the input one along the x-axis is the number of games that we have won and input two on the y-axis is the number of games that we have lost. If the data point is colored in green it means that the robot wanted to quit and if it's colored in pink that means it wanted to keep playing. Then we can apply our little model of the neuron where we were firing lasers at an LED and in this case, input one is like our first laser and input two is like our second laser. So we're getting a total intensity of light depending on our inputs. And we're also able to control our bias. And in this case, because we're plotting it on this graph, moving the bias will actually move this line through our plot. You see this bias line is in fact the place where intensity one plus intensity two is equal to the bias. If we set our bias to seven, then we are able to separate the inputs into what we want. We want these two green inputs to be able to activate the LED. That's when the robot wants to quit. And we want these pink ones to not activate the LED. So that looks good. The fact that the line goes through this green point up here is actually fine since anything equal to the bias or above will be able to activate the LED as opposed to if we put it at number six, this one would have been activated and we don't want it to be. 
So I've set the bias of this LED to 7 like we worked out in the previous graph and we can try the little uh, problem that they give us. So they say we've won 3 games and the opponent has won 4. And indeed the LED is activated here so that would mean that uh, it is predicted that our friend will want to quit. We could check it graphically, it just means that our combination of inputs is putting us up here in the green region that turns the LED on. You see we have an input of 3 and an input of 4. We're actually on that bias line there. On the next page it tells us that this line in the input space is called a decision boundary. And placing this boundary optimally is how a neuron or a neural network makes predictions about data. It is also possible to have a decision boundary with a negative slope. Jumping into the next quiz, which is called classification, we then have another example, but this time using continuous data. The particular example that they've given us is a bunch of marbles, and some of the marbles are defective. So ordinarily the marbles should be balanced, but some of them are defective because they have impurities inside them. The person in the example has measured the diameter and the mass of every marble and plotted that on a graph. And we're going to try and separate, based on diameter and mass, which marbles might be defective. And to recognize that our data is now continuous, we have our little model of the neuron back and we can adjust these sliders to try and push the activation over the bias. And there we go. Our inputs range from 0 to nearly 10, um, but it says here on the next page, a neuron doesn't understand grams and centimeters, um, or any other units for that matter. So to map between our raw data, which is mass and diameter, and the neuron's input space, which is the intensity 1 and intensity 2, we need to introduce two unknown conversion factors. WD multiplies by the diameter to get that total intensity, and WM would be the multiplier where you times it by the mass to turn it into input. We still need our total intensity to be greater than or equal to the bias for the neuron to activate, so our new activation equation would be WM times M plus WD times D being bigger than or equal to the bias. That inequality that we just came up with imposes a decision boundary on the scatter plot of data. So we can adjust the value of WM and WD as well as our bias to adjust this line accordingly. It asks what aspect of the decision boundary do WM and WD control? Well, just from fiddling around with that, they seem to be influencing the slope of the boundary. This gives us more flexibility than just being able to adjust the bias alone. See, only adjusting the bias would never really be able to get a good fit here. Now what's important here is that these conversion factors, these WM and WD, these are actually called the input weights, or often just the weights. One weight multiplies each input to the neuron. Weights can be set to whatever values produce the best classification of your data. Throughout this little quiz here, we've been adjusting the neuron's weights and bias to place a decision boundary on the scatter plot. It says that adjusting the weights and bias of a neuron to classify labeled data is known as training. So really what I hope we've gained here is a little bit of intuition about the idea of training a neuron or even training an entire network of neurons. It would seem that this idea of adjusting the weights is really crucial in making our network do what we want it to and become good at classifying data. And with that, I think we will jump back into our first quiz that we looked at and go and look at some of the actual code that would run this thing.
So I'm back here at our digit identifier, but this time it is one where all the connections between layers are randomized. So it's one where the weights uh, of our inputs are not correct as they were before. So let's see if I try to draw a one in here. Well, it's not very good anyway, but you can see it has no idea. What about a two or a three? It's really giving us no clear guess here. So we can see how important getting uh, the connections right is. Just as a high level look at how it learns before we take a look at the code, it says that during training, an artificial neural network is fed examples of digits. For each input, the neural network makes its best guess about what digit is presented, and its guess is compared to the correct answer. If its guess is correct, then nothing happens, but if it's incorrect, then the computational machinery within the neural network is updated, so it's more likely to be correct the next time. Now the code that I'm going to show you isn't actually part of the Brilliant course. I got a copy of it by contacting the course's author and asking him if I could take a look. Um, but the intention of this course is to just give us this more of an intuition at the overall ideas that are happening in neural networks, not for us to understand the code or to learn the Python, uh, which is the coding language behind it. But I thought it would be interesting for me to show you anyway. So that's just a disclaimer to not expect to find the code if you're working through the course yourself. Uh, but this is the actual code, which is running our digit identifier. Some of you might know more coding than others, and if you know some already, you might be able to read into this a bit more. But I'll just go through it quite briefly and give you a real example of what these neural networks actually look like if you were to code one for yourself. At the start, we import a bunch of things, including TensorFlow, which is a library that I believe was created by Google for doing a lot of this artificial intelligence stuff. And TensorFlow will kind of do a lot of the hard work for you. The code then moves on to reading in some data. We have some training data and some test data. And actually the data set is called MNIST, which is this big collection of hand-drawn digits. I believe it was a bunch of digits drawn by high school students and other people in the US. We'll move down to here where we're making lists for our training and test data. And this processing involves actually calling this function up here which is to shift the image and that is going to shift around the images in our data set um, by some random number of empty rows and columns and that will ensure that the test and training data that we're using is more distributed not every digit will be perfectly in the center and yeah they'll be shifted around a bit more which will hopefully lead to a better performance for our neural network the next important step is um, organizing the labels for the training and test data. Now our labels will actually be a vector of length 11 and that will be our uh, 10 digits and our blank. And this vector will have zeros in every spot except for in the numbers that it thinks it is. So if it was confident that it was a two, then the vector would be zero everywhere, except there would be a one uh, in the spot corresponding to the two. It would be zeros and ones for the training data because we know the ground truth, we're given that with the data set, um, but for when it is actually trying to work it out for itself, it wouldn't be as binary. So like we have here, we have maybe 0 0.9 in the uh, spot corresponding to two, and we have a little bit in the spot corresponding to three, maybe 0 0.1. Try a little squiggle here. And yeah, they've got maybe 80% in the seven and maybe 20% in the two, a little bit in the three even. And here's the part where we actually make the model. We are using TensorFlow and some part of the TensorFlow library called Keras, which must be the part that deals with neural networks and we're setting up a sequential network, probably meaning that we're feeding the output from one layer of neurons to be the input for the next layer, and it sort of cascades like that. We're setting up each layer to be dense, so each neuron will be connected to every other neuron. We have 
a row of 25, a row of 25, and then a final row of 11. Our activation function is a sigmoid shape, so our neurons are not binary. They can not just have zero or one inside them, they can have, you know, anything in between that. We then compile the model down here. We're using something called Adam. It's a kind of gradient descent, which is a way of learning, a way of trying to optimize a function by looking for the bottom, by descending the gradient of the function. And we define our loss, which I believe is quite important because the loss is really the thing that you are trying to optimize. You want your loss to be as minimal as possible because that would mean that you're getting closer to getting the answers correct. Our loss is the distance between our prediction and the ground truth. And with the training data, we know the ground truth. That's the number that it actually is. We're told that in the data set. So we can compare that to our prediction and get this scalar value, our loss. And we want that to go down. We want that to be as small as possible. Then you can see here what it looks like when we start to train the network. We have a few iterations, I guess, showing up here. And then all this stuff at the bottom is just to do with extracting our weights and biases. So I think uh, they can plot them on this nice little visualizer here. And there you go, that was the code behind making something like this. I hope that this video jumping from a little bit of the intuition of individual neurons to kind of how they fit together in the actual code example has uh, been interesting for you. You can jump along to the link in the description if you would like to view this brilliant course for yourself. So thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.